everybody. We're so happy to see you here in person, and we also want to welcome those who are watching on Facebook Live. Uh, we are thrilled to be here and really feel it's a privilege for us to be part of this event. So we're just going to start with some business we have to take care of. First of all, I just want to say thank you to our event sponsors, the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing at Alina Health, at the Catherine J. Densford International Center for Nursing Leadership at the University of Minnesota, Pathways Healing Center, and Conversations with Kelly. We are grateful for your support to make this event possible and for us to be in this wonderful space and to be able to open it up so broadly. And I know those organizations all have tables in the back to tell you more about their work, so make sure to visit those. Also, thank you to our outreach partners, which are here on this slide. We are grateful to you as well. Um, the biggest thank you that we want to say is to Michael Bishop for making this all possible. <laughs> Woo! So we have gotten to know Michael quite well over Zoom. So we have a Zoom relationship, and we never have met in person until today, which is wonderful. But we've talked a lot, and I can genuinely say I have love for this man. He is amazing. So we are very, we feel privileged to be a part of this today. Um, and also, thank you to Dr. Trusheim, uh, uh, Michael's neuro-oncologist, for being willing to, to join in this journey. Um, So standing next to me here is Jonathan Adler, my partner uh, in this work, and he'll tell you about himself in a minute. I'm just going to briefly tell you a little bit about me, and I think that's just important for context, but I promise we'll be brief. Uh, so I am an internal medicine physician in Boston at Mass General Hospital. I'm also a patient, so I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis a while ago now, in 2001. And so I've had sort of my own journey through the healthcare system as both a patient and a provider. And what I have felt very strongly along the way is that a lot of the brokenness of the healthcare system has to do with relationships and the lack of space for true communication, for storytelling, and genuine, authentic listening. And that's because of the constraints of the system as it is. Um, we're more focused on efficiency and the business side of medicine, scientific mastery over the relational side. And so really, I've seen this both from the patient and the provider point of view, and uh, really wanted to do something about it. So that's what led me to founding a, a nonprofit called Health Story Collaborative, which is an organization around uh, using storytelling as a therapeutic tool, put the most simply. So we aim to create space, um, both um, literal and figurative, to uh, allow for story sharing among pe people who are navigating health challenges. So that's patients, that's a patients, loved ones, and community, and also healthcare providers, because we believe that there's healing power in stories, and research supports this, and that storytelling has the power to be transformative, both for uh, individuals and for um, systems like the healthcare system. So those are our main goals and the, one of our programs, the Healing Story Sessions model that you're here to witness today is, um, is, is that exactly, to create a space for story sharing. So for this model we work with participants in advance to craft their narratives using a research-based narrative guide that we've created and then we sort of help them shape it and create an, a story that to them feels uh, authentic, but also ultimately empowering is our goal. Um, so uh, we have worked with the participants today. Michael is sort of an expert because he's also facilitated some of these events, so he uh, has that expertise as well. Uh, but we're very happy to be here. In the patient provider model of this story sharing that we're gonna see today, that comes out of sort of my feeling in healthcare that, um, Sadly, we're often sort of pitted against each other, the patient and the provider, in a subtle way. It's supposed to be a therapeutic alliance, and ideally it mostly is, but we have competing demands upon us. And sometimes, having been on both sides, patients feel frustrated, doctors feel frustrated, and we forget sort of that we all really want the same thing, which is genuine connection um, and meaningful relationships and to do good. Um, so we're here today to sort of celebrate the humanity of 
both patient and provider. And your job as the audience, you've been invited into this because we really believe there's a community healing piece as part of this. Your, your job is just to witness the story uh, and to open yourselves up to the experience and really to remember that this is a vulnerable process to get up here and share a story like this. So just to be respectful. Um, and same for people watching on Facebook Live, we encourage you to share things that you hear. We're using the hashtag healing stories for social media. But again, remembering that these are vulnerable and very personal stories, um, so to just keep that in mind. So that's all I'm gonna say for right now, and I'm gonna turn it over to John. Thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, so I will just very briefly tell you about me, and then I'll tell you how the morning's gonna work. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I'm a psychology professor at Olin College, which is an engineering school outside of Boston. And uh, my research is mostly on the ways in which we constitute a sense of self by telling stories about our lives and the ways in which those stories do and do not support our mental health. Um, so I've been working with Annie for several years now on trying to sort of marshal the social scientific literature on narrative to support the, the applied programs that we do like this one. Um, okay, so here's how this morning is going to work. Um, for the Facebook Live part, we're going to start with Michael's story. So we'll hear from Michael, and then um, that will be the end of the Facebook Live part. And then after that, we'll hear um, Dr. Trusheim's story. And then there'll be an opportunity for Michael to respond and for, for them to have a little conversation. And then after that, we will open it up for question and answer, for discussion. Um, of course, um, both participants should feel free to answer or not answer questions as you want. Um, we'll have people roving around with microphones to take your questions, but if, you want, if you'd prefer um, to jot them down, we can also collect your questions and, and ask them for you if you'd prefer that. Um, so we'll have some time for that conversation and, and, and feedback, um, and then that'll be the end of the morning's program. Um, many of you are signed up for a workshop that Annie and I are running um, in this afternoon, beginning at one o'clock, um, where we'll talk more about the research that supports the model that we've developed and, and also give you a, a chance to do some hands-on practice with this model. Um, so please, um, many of you are already planning to stick around for that, but if you decide you want to, we still have um, space outside for you to, to register for the, the afternoon workshop. Um, okay, thank you so much. With that, we'll turn it over to Michael. Come on up, Dr. Trusa. <laughs> Can you hear me? No. No? No. Do you want a handheld mic? Maybe if I stand here? That's better. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> So I had prepared really carefully with Annie and John this story. Thank you. <laughs> you can sit now if you want, yeah. And I had practiced it, and I timed it, and I felt really good about it. And then this morning, I woke up at, at 2.30 in the morning and went back to sleep a little bit, and then I went at 5.30 to the Mississippi River, which I do every day, and when I was there, it was clear no, that story's not what I'm going to do. <laughs> Sorry, Annie and John. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be parts of it. Um, but what I mostly want to do is trust the power of your listening to draw out what's most important. And I believe in prayer, and I ask several people to pray for specific people. Some for me, some for Dr. Trusheim. I didn't tell you about that. <laughs> Some for Annie, some for John, some for all of us. Um, and I trust that will guide us where we need to go to. So who knows what's going to happen in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> to start with, I want to ask you um, a couple of questions to start thinking about. And there should be on your table in front of you a yellow card that has two questions. On one side is the question, what healing have you experienced or witnessed? And the other side is, what healing do you long for? And by that, I mean, 
any kind of healing, physical, emotional, relational, political. So what I'd ask you to do, just as we're getting started, you won't need to show this to anyone, but just take a, take a minute, ponder those two questions. You could write a couple notes in there. They don't have to be legible. But I just want to have that as a reference point for later on in the morning. So just think for yourselves a minute. What, what healing have you experienced? And what healing do you long for? I'm speaking today as a guinea pig. Um, I'm speaking as a, a subject of an experiment that's in progress. I see it like a clinical trial in healing stories that I prescribed myself. And even though I prescribed it myself, I have many teachers and healers in that clinical trial. I want to tell you some stories about. Because I want the very best medical treatment that's possible. And I have a diagnosis that medical treatment doesn't offer much promise for. It doesn't offer a cure. It doesn't even promise a long life. So I need more than that. So my hypothesis in this self-prescribed clinical trial of healing stories is that if we openly and honestly tell stories about what is wounded and broken in us, and along with that, tell stories of what is healing and moving to wholeness in us, and if we do that in loving community, that will move us towards healing emotionally, physically, and relationally. And I see that practice of healing stories as a, as a practice like exercise or meditation that contributes to our health, not in a magical way, but in a contribute through practice way. And, um, I believe pre uh, preliminary, oftentimes preliminary, preliminary findings from clinical trials can be very important. I was a part of a clinical trial that Dr. Trusheim helped me do that ended up closing because, in my understanding, many of the people on the trial died. And that was an important preliminary finding. So I want to report some of my preliminary findings today in this experiment with healing stories. And the umbrella, the title of my uh, preliminary findings, is that there is a healing river coming for all of us, and it's unavoidable. So I want to tell you some stories about my experience in this trial. And I want to start by telling you about Dr. Peter Lund, who is sitting right in front of me. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter um, is a neighbor. He lives around the corner from me and my family. And up until two and a half years ago, I would say we were acquaintances. Um, we'd had dinner, our families had dinner together a couple times, um, hadn't talked too much. And we've got kids about the same age. Um, and I started having these intense headaches for the first time. I was 44 years old, mostly perfectly healthy all those 44 years. I started having these intense headaches. I went to a couple of doctors. One said, probably sinus infection. The other one said, probably migraines. But they continued and they got stronger. And so my wife and I, we talked to Peter. We're asking for help. What, what, where can we go? What should we do? Um, and it turns out Peter's a frickin' angel <laughs> with a heart bigger than oceans. 
and he's been uh, dramatically helpful to me over the last two and a half years. So Peter suggested that we go to a neurologist, and that neurologist said, well, we're gonna do an MRI just to rule things out. He said, I don't think we'll find anything, but we just need to rule things out. And two days after that, my amazing wife Jenny and I were sitting in a neurosurgeon's office, Dr. Naguib, who I'm also very grateful for. And Dr. Naguib, as some of you know Dr. Naguib, he's, he's quite a blunt, direct guy in ways I appreciate. So we're meeting him for the first time. We're sitting in his office. He comes in and he says, he's got my MRI image of my brain on the screen. And he said, there's a big thing in there. It needs to come out. I can do it in two days or two weeks. What do you want? <laughs> and he said, um, I've got to go talk to my scheduler person. I'll be back in a couple minutes. Let me know if you want to do surgery in two days. <laughs> and as you can imagine, I was in shock. I was overwhelmed. I was terrified of someone taking a saw to my head. I didn't know if we should get a second opinion. I didn't, I didn't know what we should do. And Jenny, as we're sitting there uh, in the surgeon's office without the surgeon, Jenny sent a text to Peter. And I had just that week kind of said I wanted to start going to Peter's, Peter's doctor, Peter's um, clinic as my primary care clinic. And Jenny sent him a text saying, well, we're here, we don't know what to do. And I was just looking down, panicking. And when I looked up, just moments later, Peter appeared in the chair next to me. <laughs> like magic. <laughs> I didn't know doctors could do that. <laughs> and I, I don't know if we're really supposed to be texting or doctor, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but whenever I still think about Peter showing up, so fully, I still cry thinking about how Grateful I am. And Peter reassured us that yes, actually doing surgery in two days is good. Soon is good. It's the right thing to do, which I couldn't, I, I didn't know, or I couldn't say on my own. But Peter sat there with us. Dr. Naguib, the surgeon came back in the, in the room and we agreed to do surgery in two days. So I spent two days trembling and squeezing Jenny and telling people I knew that I loved them because I didn't know if I would survive the surgery or what my functioning would be after the surgery. And shortly after the surgery, I met for the first time Dr. Trusheim. And Dr. Trusheim explained that the biopsy from the surgery showed that it was cancerous and that it was the most aggressive kind of brain cancer, glioblastoma. And Dr. Trishheim was as sensitive and skillful as possible about asking me if and when I wanted to know the statistics about average survival for this diagnosis. And I didn't want to know at first. In the next office visit, when I did finally say, yes, I want to know, Dr. Trusheim drew me a nice graph, curve, that showed, he said, depending on which study you believe, average survival is between 15 and 18 months. I think he said he tended to prefer 18 months. <laughs> I prefer it too. <laughs> And I was still overwhelmed and in shock. Jumping back in time, when I was in fifth grade, my family moved when I was in fifth grade from Kentucky to Missouri. And when we moved shortly after that, I was in the school cafeteria. And I was sitting at a table by myself and all the other boys in fifth grade were sitting at the next table talking to each other and eating. And when I was sitting at the table by myself, I was telling myself two stories. 
Stories were, one, I'm not cool enough, I'm not confident enough, I'm not good enough to be at that table. And at the same time, I was telling myself, well, actually, I'm a little bit better than them because I'm analyzing the situation <laughs> and I'm, I can see the social dynamics. I can see my own perceptions. That makes me better than them. And those two stories, that I'm not good enough and that I'm better than, have stayed with me for the 40 plus years since that time, or 35 plus years since that time in fifth grade. But when Dr. Trusheim told me about the brain cancer, I knew that I needed to live and learn different stories. And I quickly got help from that, from, among others, Emily Jarrett Hughes, who happens to be sitting right there, too. <laughs> that the same week that I had that brain surgery, Emily and my sister from England and her family, they organized a party to support my healing. That was kind of a combination of a talent show <laughs> and a prayer service and kind of like a memorial service for me that I could go to, which is kind of cool. I mean, I reckon that. And as my friends were at that event, standing around me and my family, singing to us, laying their hands on me, praying for me, for the first time, I started to tell some of my story of what it's like to be on that roller coaster of brain cancer. That I told them how magic Peter was. Peter was actually there, I believe. And I told them about how freaked out I was when Dr. Trusheim said 15 to 18 months. And as they were listening to me, as you are now, it felt like they were reaching into my belly and shifting it. That I, ever since finding out about that brain tumor, was panicked with my belly in knots and grasping for what do I need to do to live as long as possible? I don't, especially, I don't want to leave my two kids before they finish growing up. So I was grasping with my belly being tight. And when I told, started to tell my story to these friends, it felt like they did, I don't know how they did it, something to open up my belly, soften it, and help me realize that what's most important to me isn't the number of days that I live, but it's the degree to which I can take in the love that's being offered to me and let it move through me. And ever since then, that's happened over and over again, that the more I'm able to honestly and openly share what it's like for me to go through this roller coaster and that I receive people's listening and love shifts my belly from the panic to receiving love, which is my understanding of the, the foundation of healing is that shift from panic to receiving love. So after the surgery, when I met with Dr. Trusheim, he, um, he explained that the normal, normal treatment for this diagnosis is quite standard, I believe, is that you do chemo, an oral chemo, and you do radiation in the spot of the tumor. Because they've taken out um, a tumor about the size of a ping pong, um, but the kind of cancer it is, it tends to what, burrow and spread around. So you can't say, we got it all. You have to do extra stuff. So I started doing chemo and radiation. And when I started that, I have an aunt <clears throat> who lives in Indiana, Aunt Marcia. Maybe Aunt Marcia's watching. Um, and Marcia said, she said she, she felt inspired to every day when I was doing chemo, send me stories. 
stories of other people in our family who experienced challenges and found grace in those challenges. And one story she told me was about my great grandmother, who I met and really appreciated when she was alive, but I didn't, I'd never heard this story from her. My great grandmother had a daughter named Mary Esther. And when Mary Esther was a toddler, she was very sick. She took her to the doctor, it was an obstructed bowel. And the doctor said, I can't do anything for her. My great grandmother was at home making dinner, and Mary Esther came over and tugged on her apron and said, Mama, can you rock me? My great grandmother picked up Mary Esther. She rocked her, she sang to her, and Mary Esther died in her arms. So Marcia is telling me this story. And she adds to that, that when my great grandmother was dying, Marcia was there next to her and asked her, could she hold her the way she did for her daughter when she died? And Marcia said that was one of the most euphoric things in her life. And my great grandmother and Mary Esther and Marcia started teaching me that healing and dying sometimes go together. They're not enemies. So a few months went by. <clears throat> I was doing the chemo, I finished the radiation, and I went in for a regular MRI of my brain, which I have and still do on a regular basis. And I walked in to Dr. Trusheim's office, and I asked him, how does the MRI look? And Dr. Trusheim said very calmly, could be better. And he then explained that in the area where the tumor was taken out, there had been growth again. And he was pretty certain it was cancerous. And in the days following that time, I again felt panic, confused and overwhelmed. And this time I felt angry. I felt angry this was happening. And also I felt angry at Dr. Trusheim. I wanted different information and I wanted, I wanted to feel more power to figure this out. I didn't feel power and I didn't feel trust and partnership with Dr. Trusheim. I felt lonely. And my wife and I, in the next few days, we scrambled and researched options and have found a clinical trial that was available through Dr. Trusheim's office in the hospital. And right before I had a second surgery, the clinical trial, thanks to Dr. Trusheim and others, got put in place. But it was a very stressful couple days. And after that sur surgery, shortly after I got out of the hospital, I wrote a letter to Dr. Trusheim. And I knew that I needed to tell my story in a new way, because if I was going to feel trust and partnership with Dr. Trusheim and with other doctors and people, I needed to take responsibility for that as much as anybody. And honestly, at that time, I, I wanted another oncologist. And I did meet with another oncologist. But when I thought about it and prayed about it, I wanted to more intentionally choose Dr. Trusheim as a partner in healing. And I knew very likely a partner in my dying. And Dr. Trusheim and his staff generously received 
that input. And a few months went by, and again, I started to feel like, okay, it's maybe going to get kind of normal. But then again, I started to get intense headaches. And I went to the emergency room and eventually found out that I had meningitis, infection in my spinal fluid, which I also knew could quickly kill you, like the brain cancer can. Then I was in the hospital several days with meningitis. After one test, my spinal fluid came back. I talked to Peter and he said, no, this is serious, you have to go. You have to go to the hospital to get on serious antibiotics. And that time I was in the hospital, <clears throat> there were several doctors then working with me including an infectious disease doctor, Dr. Trisha and Peter and others. And at that time, they didn't all agree on what to do with me. As I understand it, the infectious disease doctor said, you're going to need to have another surgery to take out the titanium, the screw that's in my skull from the previous surgery. He thought the infection was caused by that screw and it wouldn't go away until that happened, until it was taken out which would mean there'd be a big, soft spot in my head forever. But I believe Dr. Trusheim and my surgeon were cautious about maybe that's not a good idea. And I felt confused and overwhelmed and afraid of dying from meningitis or cancer and wasn't sure which one. Just a race between those two. In the hospital. And in the hospital that time, there was a woman who came in to clean my room. His name is Pema. And as Pema was taking out the trash, she did a story intervention on me. She told me a story about her son, who had a serious kind of cancer also, and how she took him to a monastery, and how he got better. And she looked at me, she knew I was freaked out, she looked at me and she said, with authority, she said, doctors and prayer can work together. And she gave me a kind of peace and comfort that doctors weren't able to at that time. And a couple of months went by of being on antibiotics. And it was a little bit unclear if and when I should go off the antibiotics. But in talking to Peter and Dr. Trusheim, I decided to go off the antibiotics. And Pema was right. Doctors in prayer worked together, and the meningitis went away without the surgery. This past winter, Dr. Trusheim did a story intervention on me, which he might not have thought of as such. <laughs> but I had gone in for a regular MRI and went into the clinic and to see what the results were. And Dr. Trusheim said, well, it's stable, just like it's been the last year now. And Dr. Trusheim, as I remember it, said, you can start imagining life beyond the next two months when the next MRI is. You can expand how you see life. And I think Dr. Trusheim saw that I was living in a story that was afraid to imagine anything possible beyond when I do my next MRI in two or three months. And he was inviting me to live in a bigger story, to imagine life beyond those two months. And I'm very grateful for Dr. Trishheim's willingness to walk with me in the unique, unpredictable path of my brain cancer, which I'm guessing for most patients does not involve what we're doing right now. <laughs> it's just the third one this week. The David. third one. <laughs> it's quite a sport. Well, and in fact, when I asked Dr. Trishheim to do this, he said, he said yes, and that he would be Keith Richards playing riffs. I think he's got his guitar in there, and I could be Mick Jagger up here dancing around. <laughs> he 
is that a good sport or what? <laughs> so I love that willingness to be with me in the unique unfolding of my journey. The one of my favorite authors, John O'Donohue, my friend Peter's helped me get to know. John O'Donohue says, I would love to live like a river flows, carried by the surprise of its own unfolding. And that's my understanding of the healing power of stories, that a good story unfolds the next image, the next emotion, the next action in a way that always keeps us guessing and wondering what's next without jumping to the conclusion and just saying the conclusion, but living and feeling the next step one at a time with curiosity. I was talking recently with Mary Jo Kreitzer, who is a leader both nationally and locally in studying and defining what healing is. We were talking about how there's not a lot of common scientific definition and study about healing. And Mary Jo says, but one thing you can say is you can say healing is possible. And I found that helpful And what I want to say from my experience is that healing is not only possible, but it's possible at times when death seems imminent or isolation seems permanent. And I want to add, have the audacity to add to Mary Jo's statement that healing is inevitable and unavoidable. It just probably won't look like we thought it would. There's another story that my Aunt Marcia told me when I was doing chemo about my great Aunt Ruby, who's quite a character who also knew and appreciated. And when Ruby was dying, she was quite isolated. Her husband had died, she didn't have any children, she didn't really have any friends. And my Aunt Marcia was taking care of her as she was dying. And in that time before death, when people tend to kind of come in and out of consciousness, when Ruby would wake up, she would often say, it's, it's amazing, it's unbelievable. And one time when she woke up, she said, I had it wrong. Life is about love. And she was dazzled and amazed by how she was being inundated with that love as she was dying, even though She had been mean to her caregivers and driven many of them away and was in an isolated condition. She was overwhelmed by healing and love. When I was doing chemo, there was also a time I was having dinner with my family. And I had told my Kids, a lot of times, I was quite naggy about, wash your hands, don't stick your fingers in the chips, and I was afraid of dying from germs because my white blood cell count was low. And one time at dinner, I said to my family, I said, I feel lonely and sad about nagging you so much about washing your hands, and, and one of my kids had just double-dipped his carrot in the hummus, <laughs> and I had snapped at him about double dipping could kill me or something like that. (laughs) And then I told my two kids and my wife I felt lonely and sad about nagging them so much. And my daughter replied, yeah, dad, but you tell us that all the time and you don't need to. And I felt more lonely and sad. And after dinner, I was was in my bedroom feeling lonely and sad. And I overheard my kids talking to each other preteen and teen. And my son was telling my daughter something to the effect of, I think dad was trying to get us, he was trying to help us understand what it's like for him and maybe we could, we could be more supportive of him. And they didn't know I was listening to this. But when I heard that, I started crying about how supported I felt. 
how much I love my son who said that. Then my son walked past the door. He's 14 at this point. He walked past my bedroom door and he said, hi, Dad, what you doing? I said, uh, I'm crying about how much I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pretty sure, as a 14-year-old boy, or most people, he would run really quickly away. <laughs> but he didn't run away. Instead, he came into my room, he climbed on my bed with me, and he grabbed my hands. And he looked into my eyes, which, of course, totally lost it then. <laughs> I'm just slobbering on him. And uh, after, you know, a minute or so, I, I let go of his hands because I didn't want to torture him with my tears. But when I let go of his hand, he grabbed tighter. And then out then, my daughter walked by my room, and I said to her, before she asked what we're doing, I said, hey, Grace. Oops, I said her name. <laughs> can you come in, here, come in here so I can cry about how much I love you? <laughs> she cooperated. <laughs> I squeezed her hand to cry about how much I loved her. And my wife came in. I cried all over her. And I believe Ruby, my aunt, my great aunt, was right that that love is unavoidable. And I'm very grateful for my kids and others who keep teaching me how to receive it. Because that, to me, is the foundation of all healing, receiving love. And the medical treatment can make that possible and complement that in really important ways. And in this mm, practice of healing stories, I think like with all treatments, there can be dangerous side effects. I think the most dangerous side effect that I know about is if I take my story too seriously, or think it's the only truth. And the best antidote that I know about to that side effect is to open up to other people's stories of what's painful for them and what's healing in them. And I know that there are others of you here today who also are facing aggressive cancer. And I know there are others of you here today who long to be present and supportive to your kids in ways you're afraid you can't. And I know there are those of you here deeply grieving loved ones who have recently gone away. I have a friend, Barbara McAfee, who also is sitting right here. Wow. <laughs> and when Barbara sings, I often feel this spiritual power wash over me and envelop me like a healing river. And right now, I would like to invite, remind you of those yellow cards I asked you about at the beginning, and invite any of you who want to acknowledge silently healing that you long for, physically, emotionally, in relationship. If you'd like to acknowledge that and receive that healing river, to silently stand up, just wave your hands. And in a minute, I'm going to invite Barbara to come up and sing to us as we imagine that healing river washing over us. So please join me in standing if you'd like to. And Barbara, please sing to us. This is a song by Moira Smiley. 
and I sing it frequently to the Mississippi River where Michael and I linger quite often. Come and stand in that river, current gentle and slow. Send your troubles down water, down on that river flow. When you stand in that river, my most recent appointment with Dr. Trishheim a few weeks ago. Um, Dr. Trishheim told me that the MRI was stable. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were talking about some uh, medication I'm taking to prevent seizures. Um, and there was a problem with it because it was going to cost me $500 to get a refill. We we're brainstorming what to do. And as we did that, I had talked about the pills I have been taking. I kind of prefer those because they're small and they're cute and I'm used to them. <laughs> and Dr. Trusheim said something like, I'm going to try to bring us back to the objective. <laughs> What's the evidence for what works and what the side effects are? And I really appreciate the expertise and objective wisdom Dr. Trushan brings to my care and so many others. And I also really very much appreciate Dr. Trushan, your willingness to dive deeply into this messy, subjective part of healing. And I'm very, very interested in hearing about your subjective experience of being a doctor and dealing with all this mess. Well, I'm not sure what to say first. I'm glad you prayed for me at the start. That was a good way to begin things. And I, if you don't mind, I'll just stand. Is that going to work out okay? Yeah. So well, Michael and I overlap in more ways than you might think, although my heritage is only slightly different and my role in Michael's uh, care is, is different than his, of course. So in those ways, we're separate. So I suppose that's the best way to approach this. We have a lot of overlaps. Uh, he mentioned Indiana. That's where my youth was spent. So that's important. And uh, he mentioned something about Missouri. I heard that in there. Grew up a Cardinals fan in St. Louis, of course. Played baseball like nobody's business. So that was part of our overlap there. John O'Donohue, I'm more than familiar with. Uh, I have to read it metaphorically, I have to say that, because it's backwards of everything else I think of. If anybody knows John O'Donohue, the poet, it's a, a quite different, uh, the soul being something that I think is out of us, and body and vice versa. So that's uh, 
something that I enjoy, but I do have to read it metaphorically. Uh, so I grew up as a doctor because uh, my grandfather, very important to me, um, excuse me, uh, taught me most of everything. And if you want to know what he was like, he was pretty much like John Wooden. If you ever heard of John Wooden, he's a basketball coach. And he's from Indiana, too. And he speaks just like John Wooden. And he says pretty much what John Wooden says, which is, do your best. That's what you're here for. So, <clears throat> excuse me. That was everything. That was everything to me. Uh, so I was lucky to be in a family very supportive, a little different faith tradition as I think what you guys call it these days. I was a Lutheran, which meant a lot of rules. There was a good reason to be a Lutheran, which was that you didn't have to pay anything to the church, but that was kind of beyond my understanding at that point. I just, I just knew you had to believe and that was it, which meant uh, seven days meant seven days. So. I had a problem with that as someone who could do mathematics. Um, so we parted ways there. That was probably the big thing for me, is that everyone has their schisms or conflicts in life. And probably my leaving the church was actually the biggest. Uh, because you wouldn't believe it, but uh, it's kind of like if you were, grew up as a scientist, I tell my wife, she's uh, quite a scientist. Her father was a scientist, etc. It's kind of like if she became a druid. <laughs> That's kind of the schism between me and the Lutherans. So we've healed it, but it was a big deal. So very few people, I think, uh, can tell me stuff that's a conflict bigger than that. So I was very uh, rambunctious, somewhat rebellious, pretty much uh, self-reliant for many years. Um, and uh, but made it into medical school. I was happy to be there. Turned down uh, going in six years instead of eight because I wanted to go to more college. That would be the opposite of today where you would want to go in quick order. Uh, but I wanted to go to college longer. So I always felt that uh, medicine was my calling because I had to save my grandfather who died, of course. I was there when that happened. Um, so, um, but I also felt that medicine was a little constricting. I was used to reading everything and anything and doing everything and anything. Medicine is uh, very complicated and very hard, but uh, very confined. You have to know human biology, but what turtles do doesn't really matter to you or something like that. So I felt it confining until I met a few people who were excellent physicians and uh, taught me uh, how to approach problems, how to deal with people. Uh, one was a wizard. He was a neurologist, which is why I'm a neurologist. Uh, he could diagnose something with only uh, two minutes of diagnosis uh, questions and one minute of exam, and he was always right. And so to me, that was outstanding, and I was hooked. But I always wanted to be an oncologist, and neurologists aren't really oncologists. So fortunately, I was able to carve that path before very many people were neuro-oncologists, and there wasn't a place to go to school for it. So fortunately, I was rambunctious enough to ask the great oncologist at the university, who is B.J. Kennedy, to take me on. And I think just because I was bold enough to ask him like three times and ask him why the heck he wouldn't take me on, he took me on. And so I was able to do that. And I've been happy with what that is. Uh, so that's my story in a quick nutshell as to why I am what I am and what I do what I do. Um, I've always felt that the doctor has to be, because this is my training, uh, compassionate but objective. And that's where Mike and I make a good team because I want him to communicate to me and I want him to know that I care about him. But uh, I'm the analytical side of life, and that's how I've always been in medicine. I want to know what the problem is and why it is that way and what we can do to fix it. And that's why we do research at the Given Center and why we do all kinds of other things. And so we go together well that way.
because I'm sure that he'll tell me what he's thinking and I can kind of help us imagine what's possible. And that's where we get together. So I think that's a good starting point for a discussion, if that's okay with you. Uh, so that's where I'm at with things. Thanks for listening. Who's designated as our mic runners? Because we have microphones. Yep. So if we have some volunteers who can have some mics and bring them around, and if anyone has question cards that they filled out, maybe those volunteers can collect those as well. Um, thank you both so much. That was incredible and amazing to be invited into those stories. So the first thing that we like to do in these kind of events is to have the speakers uh, respond to each other. They have not heard each other's stories in that way before or read them. So um, I'm going to start with Michael and let him uh, respond to Dr. Trusheim if he wants to. Well, I want to reiterate your willing. I'm so grateful for your willingness to do this with me. <laughs> that Dr. Trusheim is kind of a big shot. That um, a really big shot, he says. <laughs> In the world of neuro-oncology, he knows a lot, and he's very respected. Um, and I understand it's, 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 not, it's outside of that normal world to do this. And um, if I could, I have a question for you that I'm not just today, but lots of, way, lots of times doing really weird stuff. I would guess being a difficult patient <laughs> in some ways. Let me, let me list some of the ways I think it's difficult. <laughs> that, um, so I talked about t today being angry with you. And I wrote you a letter about that. And, um, and then I had people pray for you. I had this powerful tall woman sing to us. <laughs> I have no reason to stop, by the way. <laughs> On stage in front of these people. I'm doing all I can to encourage you. I, I do what I can to, as you're bringing the objective, I'm trying to bring the spiritual to my healing and to our relationship. And I want to know what that's like for you and how you manage my excessive touchy feelingness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't, can you hear me okay? Is this on? Uh, well, I, I just respect you as a person, Mike, and so that's part of what you are, and that's, you have to meet people where they're at. So people might ask me, you know, my, my history wouldn't be that I would be sitting in front of people in a suit and a tie. So you could, if you knew me in college, you would wonder why that was. Well, my job is not to make you uh, meet me somewhere. I need to dress and act in a way that I'm approachable to you. And I... We take care of people that are uh, difficult. That's true. I don't consider you difficult. You're a spiritual person. That's not a difficulty. That's probably a gift. Uh, but the job of the doctor is to try to take the person from where they're at, understand them, and move them in an agreeable path forward. And so when you pray for me, I appreciate that. When you tell me how you feel, I appreciate that. It gives me guidance as to what we're doing right or wrong for you. But I, I wouldn't think of it as an adversarial thing. I think it's a, a informational moment, an informational, educational moment, I think the teachers like to call it. Uh, so uh, I think uh, perhaps some physicians feel threatened by that, uh, but I really don't. Uh, I, I have certain confidence in my advice. It's, it's as reasonable as anybody could give you, but if I could modify it so it's more palatable or better understood or change it so it matters more to you in a certain way, that's okay with me. So how about that? Thank you. And I want to say one other maybe audacious thing. <laughs> that <clears throat> when I was telling that story about being in the fifth grade at the table by myself and analyzing what was happening, I was thinking of you as well. <laughs> ah, sure. <clears throat> and I don't know what you were like in fifth grade, but... Mm -hmm. I was at that other table. Oh, there. good. You're the cool kid. <laughs> I remember you from that, too. Yeah, yeah, right. 
But I, um, back when I was wishing for a different oncologist and deciding I wanted to more intentionally choose you as a neuro-oncologist, my understanding then and now is that we are joined at the soul for some reason. That we have different styles, but my understanding of that temptation I have to get lost in analysis and that separates me from other people and myself in life, I see that tendency in you as well. And I want our relationship to be a healing experience for both of us. Right. And I don't want to be fixing you, but I want this to be a mutually healing relationship. Well, I'll, I'll do what I can. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Can That's I fine. ask you, Dr. Trusheim, if, is that on? I don't think so. if you learned anything new about Michael today that you didn't know before? Well, a lot of the spiritual stuff, I don't know that we had been very specific about that. And forgive me if I forgot, but I don't think so. Uh, so that was pretty deep. I, I didn't have any idea you knew anything about John O'Donohue, so my compliments to you. Uh, surprise, but to the good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, well, sure, I think Michael's uh, uh, intersection and involvement with his community is so deep that I didn't appreciate that part of it, for sure. Uh, perhaps some of your fears, I don't know that you spoke with me directly about those. I'd have to say that uh, I didn't mean to ignore it if it was there. I, th I would say 99% of my patients are afraid, so we have to do our best to help them. And, and if we didn't connect enough with you to make you feel less fearful, that was uh, a failing perhaps, but uh, we really do try. So that way I would apologize if you felt alone, because so we were certainly geared the other way if we can possibly be so. So I guess that's what I learned. That's terrific. Before we open it up to others, I have one prompt, too, for you each. This is not a typical part of the doctor-patient relationship. Um, and I, so, I only can do this on Fridays. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, for you. I'm kind of busy the rest of the time. <laughs> but I, I would be interested to hear both of you reflect in this moment. Your relationship will continue to unfold after this moment, but in this moment, to just reflect on what this has meant, what this last hour has meant and, and how you sort of make sense of what we've done here today. Um, this last hour makes me love John. I'm sorry, Dr. Shersheim more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I accept you for whatever you say. <laughs> and I hope he still lets me be his patient after I say <laughs> Well, no, but we can talk about that later. I, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. To me, it's a privilege to be a physician. Uh, it really is. I wouldn't do anything else. Uh, so it's just a privilege. I appreciate that. And uh, that's what I gained out of it is just uh, another appreciation of that. All right. So we have plenty of time. We'd love to hear reflections, questions, insights, whatever whatever you out there are feeling and want to share. We'd love to invite you in. And we'll bring you the mic. Yeah. So uh, a lot of us know Michael as sort of the poster child for transparency, if you look in the dictionary under transparency. <laughs> and that's at least a little exceptional in my experience. And I'm wondering, Dr. Trusheim, if there's anything challenging in, in that, or if there's something you want to share about what's challenging on your side of those you know, difficult moments um, in this safe place to share what's going on. Because I don't know much about the world of a doctor's experience of patients. Well, there's conflicting uh, agendas there, so not to be too over-analytical for Mike, but uh, the job is to really be able to step back from a situation as a doctor and say what would be best for this patient. And so there's kind of an unwritten or maybe written rule that if you're too emotionally attached or some other way engaged with that patient, or maybe it's a family member, 
that that throws that judgment off quite a bit. And so there's a tension there, which isn't an adversarial tension, but which I'm very respectful of. So that's probably where Mike might feel that there's a distance now and again. But I maintain that because I have, I'm old now, I have a lot of experience at this, and the uh, poor individuals that get too close lose their ability to see the picture. And those, these people, uh, not to be vainglorious about it, but he's trusting me to give him the best advice for his life. So I have to make sure that I can do that. Uh, so in that way only, I think that there is a tension. Other than that, I, I actually appreciate people telling me things because otherwise I can, because uh, most of the time I'm pretty jovial. I, I just presume that people are feeling okay if they don't tell me. And so that can get lost. And some people maybe feel that I ignored them just because maybe I told them a joke and they wanted to hear something else other than a joke. So it, the transparency doesn't bother me, but there's a tension with that I want to be sure that I'm his doctor in a true sense. And for buddies, that's great because he's a great guy. But first, I have to be his doctor because that's the role I've taken on. So that takes that tension there. Can I, can I comment on that quickly just as, as a doctor? Because I think that's absolutely right, that there is this sort of... Um, responsibility that we carry to try to be objective as doctors and to be guides and not to be clouded by our emotions. And I think that is definitely true. I will say that um, I have shifted slightly in my navigation of that fine line uh, in my experience uh, over the years. I think having sat on the patient's side made me see it differently but I still try to walk that line of holding on to the objectivity. But I think I've probably been more, those boundaries have become slightly blurrier for me, for better or for worse. Always, I'm careful never to share of myself in a way that would be burdensome to a patient. We never want them to have to take care of us. That's a flip. We also want to give sound advice and concrete advice. That's what people are looking for. But I also, I think that I have shifted in that I'm more willing to share bits of my personal life in a way that I didn't before um, because as a patient, I sometimes felt that's what I wanted and because that's the kind of person I am more. So it's become a little fuzzier for me, uh, again, for better or for worse. And again, I've struggled with walking that line of being able to give very clear advice that people want. People want guidance. That's why they're coming to the doctor. We have knowledge and expertise to teach them. But I also have been in the position of being the patient who is saying, I'm not going to do that uh, because I don't think that's right right now, which is hard to do, to stand up to your doctor that way. So I think that I have become uh, more understanding in my patients when they don't want to do what I say, whereas I used to sort of think they should follow my advice because that's why I'm here. I think I have shifted to think, they are driving the ship, and I'm here to be a guide and to offer my expertise and to try, as Dr. Trusheim said, to hold on to that objectivity and clarity as much as possible. But I got a little fuzzy, I guess is all I'm trying to say. And I'll just add one other thing. Annie and I are teaching a, a class on, on listening to patient stories at Harvard Medical School right now. And to a person, the students in our class, it may be a generational thing, but they are approaching the practice of medicine from that relational experience. And they also are processing all of the new information that they're learning during medical school through their own intensely emotional experience of the rigor that it takes to be trained as a doctor these days. So uh, there's also something about meeting people, the people, both the patient and the physician, where they're at. Other... Hi, Michael. Uh, I, I want to hear more about your relationship with the Mississippi, about how, how do you interact with the river? How did it draw you? Was it a lightning bolt from heaven? Or did this awareness grow that this huge presence has something to teach me? What a good question, Susan. <laughs> I was just hoping I could want a chance to talk about the river. 
And I went to the river this morning at 5.30, and the river had some things to say that I wanted to relay. <laughs> um, but first I want to tell a little story, if I could, in response to that question. Um, so I decided when I finished my medical treatment that I wanted to continue some treatment, um, but it wasn't going to be formal medical treatment, which is at that point I decided to go to the river every day, partly knowing some of the research about the benefits of being in beautiful natural places and relaxation in that way. Um, <clears throat> but it's much more mm, personal and mysterious than that in a way too. And hopefully this story expresses some of that. <clears throat> Is there some my water over there? Um, so, could you, <laughs> so last fall, one of the places I go to at the river <clears throat> is a shallow lake that is attached to the Minnesota River right before the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi River, which and that was one of the things that I was hearing from the river this morning is um, how little we tend to understand, most of us who live here, what a sacred place that is, the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota, that most Dakota people have known for generations that that is a profoundly sacred place, and how little we know of that, and what an amazing resource for healing that is. How can we not know that here close to it? So I was, I was close to that place last fall in October in this shallow lake. And um, in this lake, it's a place where there's pelicans, hundreds of pelicans that come every spring and fall generally and hang out in this lake on their way in the midst of their migration. <clears throat> and I go <clears throat> sit by the river for at least half an hour every day and I was at this place with the pelicans last fall. And it was an unusually warm October day. And so there are at least 100 pelicans out there. And I, I decided, I was wearing these pants. I decided I'm going to roll up my pants and I'm going to walk out into the lake as far as I can, close to the pelicans, see what happens. And it's shallow, but muddy. And so I, I kept rolling up my pants, kept walking closer. And as the closer I got to the pelicans, the, which stayed there staring at me, like, what's this guy doing? The closer I got to the pelicans, I just kept laughing outside, out loud to myself, like, Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to walk in the middle of the fall up to 100 pelicans? Um, am I allowed to still be alive when so many people I've met with glioblastoma are not alive? I don't understand why I'm allowed to be here. But the pelicans just kept staring at me, and I kept walking closer until I got up to about there. <laughs> and that, to me, is my experience of healing, that what I can do is kept Keep taking one step deeper into the water, into the river, letting it wash over me, letting me be amazed by these pelicans that have a bigger wingspan than me, just be there staring at me. And I want to keep taking that next step deeper into the river and trusting that's, that's enough. Hi. Um, I have a quick remark, and then I just I had a question. Um, I just want to say thank you for talking, um, Annie, I believe, about your story. Um, I'm somebody who has a, a permanent chronic illness, and I've been to different doctors 87 times in two years. And I, I want to offer to the room that so many um, folks with chronic illness or terminal illness are we're looking not for MRI scans and results, but we're really looking for hope. Um, and so I, I would encourage that um, a lot more healthcare practitioners um, explore that, you know, being able to give pa patients hope. Because if I can find a good doctor like that, I'll go back to the same doctor. And I've been to the same, some doctors for the last 10 years because of that, more than their expertise. Um, and, my, my, and, my, and so with that, I have a question, which is, um, where do any of you see the role of spirituality um, working in congruence with with your your healthcare practice, and I I say this from uh, um, my role as um, an emerging shaman. Uh, I'm just interested in where where that could maybe live or play together. Well, thank you for raising that issue. 
Um, before I get to the spirituality question, I'll just say I think there is always room for hope, even when there is no hope of cure, if that makes sense. So we can always hope for healing, and I think Michael has made that clear. And healing can come in many forms. So I agree that we need to always keep that hope um, alive. In terms of spirituality, I absolutely believe that it can work hand in hand. I think people come with lots of different faiths, um, but I think that is a very important part of healing. And I'm going to guess that Michael has something to say on that topic. Maybe. I think Dr. Trusheim does too. What did you say? <laughs> I think Dr. Trusheim might. <laughs> I don't. I think I mentioned briefly or in passing that I just don't feel it's a competitive field. I just feel that it's a complementary to each other, and uh, so I don't. I'm not one that seeks out ad adversity in that. If if it gets in the way of something I feel it should be done, uh, for some reason, be it religious or otherwise, I guess that's something to be discussed. But the person is their own agent. They're their own person, and as long as they've understood and. I'm, comfortable that they've understood what I've asked them to do and they find a conflict, I think it's their life. Um, but I don't really find that to happen very often in my patients. Usually we're open enough to allow them or have them or whatever verb you want to put in there uh, to pursue their spirituality. It doesn't seem to conflict with any of my endeavors. So I'm, I'm sorry you ran into something that was seemed to be conflicting, but that wouldn't really necessarily be the case in my practice. Um, I have a lot to say about that. You might need to cut me off soon here, Andy. <laughs> and we'd be happy happy to talk with you, Sandy C., about that. Um, the, um, there's a book by a physician called Mind Over Medicine that my dear friend Janet recommended to me that has a model of um, health and pursuing health with a little diagram. And at the bottom, that's a, like a pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid foundation of all health is what she says is our inner pilot light, which I think is all about our spirituality, which we don't do alone. And that there's all kinds of things that build on top of that and things we can do medically to support that. But that the foundation is always that inner pilot light. And there's another physician who wrote a book that I recently, some conversation with Wayne Jonas, who talks about through lots of kind of meta analysis of medical studies, 80% of healing comes from areas outside of medical treatment. Our behaviors, our attitudes, our community, our environment. And only 20% comes from medical intervention. And so I think all good healthcare acknowledges and works with that in, humil in hu humility with that 80%, which is very much of that is spirituality and so much more. So I think, I think all good uh, medicine, which is, I think, both the patient's responsibility and the providers is to find ways to integrate that and acknowledge the the core of that, which I think is is there's different ways to say it, but I think it's it's love. And I also want to say with with that core of love is that part of my goal is always going to be to love Dr. Trishheim <laughs> and respecting that um, professional boundaries while trying to jump over it. <laughs> and 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 I also want to acknowledge that there in in my attempts to do that jumping over the fences. Um, Dr. Trusheim has very wisely surrounded himself by an amazing, amazing set of women in his clinic who are all open-hearted, relational, beautiful people, and um, some of whom are here today, like Deborah and Margaret. Um, and I love that you've had the wisdom to do that. And part of my goal is to then kind of use them as bridges to keep jumping into your heart. <laughs> Well, I'll try to stand up. Um, I was hit by a car a year and a half ago, and I have a traumatic brain injury, and positional vertigo is one of my problems. Um, but I really want to thank you for this event today, and hopefully there will be more of them, and I would encourage you to try to get some media coverage. Um, if there's one thing I learned being unconscious for three weeks and being in the hospital for three months uh, to recover is that uh, while I had a fabulous neurosurgeon, I do think that the medical system is somewhat broken. And, and what I'm hearing here today is that um, the doctors have a lot of knowledge capacity, 
but they don't all always have the relational capacity that you have. And we need to have stronger relational capacity, i.e. The, the patients letting the doctors know their perspective on something and the doctors be willing to listen to that and to have good relationship skills. Um, one of the things I think that I am wrestling with now and is the biggest challenge for me is walking out of every doctor appointment. I've been to many different kinds of doctors um, with four sheets of paper as to what they did when, when, I, when I was there, but most of it is in a language I can't even understand. And 50% of it, 80% of it, I don't know what in the world they're saying, and I don't know where to call to have somebody translate this for me. And so communication is a big issue. Um, very analytical doctors, and they put it in medical terminology, and it's like, well, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate this. This, this is a breakthrough, in my opinion, uh, this kind of knowledge relationship um, dichotomy that we have on the stage and trying to bring these things together. And I hope that the School of Nursing and other medical facilities uh, understand the importance of, re of building relational capacity in the future. We must have that. And I work for a natural resources agency and with scientists, and they all are very analytical, but they don't do so well on the relational capacity side of things. And we have demonstrated local governments throughout the state of Minnesota, through surveys with the University of Minnesota, that they really feel their greatest weakness is relational capacity. Thank you. Um, Michael, thank you all for this. Michael, I am wondering if you would be willing to be a little more explicit about that turning point in your relationship with your doctor? Like, what was not working that led you to write the letter? And, you know, kind of what, what did you ask for? I mean, I know you were intentional. I don't know how much you want to say, but I mean, it seemed like that was key to switching things and could be helpful for people to know how to, as a patient, manage a relationship like that. Um, I'm pondering. <laughs> Do you have an answer, Annie? <laughs> no, I don't have an answer. I was going to say, well, you ponder. <laughs> I could comment um, on some thoughts that just pop into my head. But yeah. you keep pondering because we're coming back yeah, to you. Keep talking. Um, I, I just want to say um, I think um, a lot of times, you know, I'm thinking about being on the doctor side now and, and that sort of that rift that is so common in the patient-provider relationship now and the competing demands that are upon us, I think – when I have a patient that's upset or is not getting what they need from me, I try to make myself open for that feedback, and I try to remember that they're feeling vulnerable. I think being a patient, and I've been on that patient side as well, it's incredibly vulnerable, and there's a lot of fear, um, obviously, because you're dealing with this medical system, which I am a doctor, and I still can't figure out how to navigate sometimes as a patient. Um, so I think... Um, there is, you know, sometimes doctors find themselves getting even angry when they don't want to. They want to be caring, but they're feeling so stressed by this 15-minute time limit and this crunch and all the paperwork and the numbers, and they're unhappy, I think, uh, underneath. And I think patients are often feeling afraid. And I think that fear can sometimes manifest itself as anger or as excessive demands or as wanting tests or but I try to remember that we're really wanting the same thing I think that there's a yearning for connection for wanting to do good for wanting to um, feel connected and to heal um, so that's not really answering the question but I just think that that's the framework that I come to often and when I was a primary care doctor when I was really under time pressure now I'm under ur work in urgent care so I have more time I used to stop and s I actually do, it's ridiculous, but um, I would say to the patients, you know, we're actually on the same side and we have to try to remember that because it's really broken and um, I would invite a patient to uh, tell me um, directly, as Michael did with his letter, what wasn't feeling right and would be actually consider that a gift to be able to have that door open for communication. That's all you. Um, well, I want to start by reiterating, I love Dr. Trusheim, and I'm happy he's my oncologist, <laughs> neuro-oncologist. Um, and the specific one point that I was angry about was 
I mean, I think it's an impossible situation for both a patient and a neuro-oncologist or any, any kind of intense medical pressure where you, you have to act very quickly and you wish for the luxury of having lots of time to understand the options and reflect on them and you just don't have that. Um, so I think it was, it was more the situation, but there was one specific treatment I wanted to know about that um, I wished Dr. Shushan had told me about um, that it didn't. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest pivot was in me of realizing I, I need to be and I can be a partner in this relationship and in my healing, that I'm not just a, a passive recipient and I have to act that way. And another key in that time was um, Dr. Lund, who um, as a primary care physician was an amazing bridge for me of helping, as he was in the surgeon's office, helping me navigate and understand and translate all the, all the research. And also just want to add one other testimony for um, the life course program that's in Dr. Trusheim's office and some other Alina programs that Deborah um, is here and works with me on that, that it's designed for connecting what's most important for patients and their stories with the medical team and treatment. And it's just an amazing, beautiful gift. So I'm grateful for the wisdom to have that as part of the overall clinic. Please, yeah, why don't you pose our last, Hi. give us our last reflection. Last comment. I'm Peter Lund. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just him. wanted to say that one of the things that is sometimes left out when we talk about the power of a healing story for the patient is how powerful that connection can be for doctors. And we all want to be part of a team and really be pulling and getting the most out of each other intellectually and allowing each other to be a little bit vulnerable. And I feel like through Michael, Dr. Trusheim and I have become uh, closer and more collegial. Me and Dr. Nagib, you know, a general internist who teaches primary care and a neuro-oncologist and a neurosurgeon and infectious disease doctors, all we all want the same thing, which is Michael to trust us, to recognize that there is not one single path and that we're going to go through it together that Dr. Trusheim can say something that Michael doesn't understand, and then he can come to me, and I will translate for him, and then I will go to Dr. Trusheim to make sure that what I told Michael was actually correct. <laughs> and I have no special expertise in glioblastoma, so it's been exciting for a, a physician and my young resident physicians to, to learn about an illness, but, but connect it with a person. And now I have an entire team of well, now about 50 residents who have touched Michael's care, at least in one way or another, each one of them getting this special gift of how the story and the person and working as a team can give us all so much uh, joy. And I'm just curious from Dr. Trusheim's standpoint, I just feel like uh, a, having a patient like Michael, you can't have all your patients be like Michael because <laughs> you don't have time, but having a patient like Michael, <laughs> my, but, Having a patient like Michael, I think, gives us all a little spark. And I've, know, I've felt it, and I feel it like when we have coffee together and talk about his care. And I think that's something we, uh, we should remember. So uh, I just want to echo what uh, Paul said. It's, you know, it's, our, it's our gift and our joy to, to help someone. And Michael is someone that I think has come a long way in part because of us and because of all you out here. So we're extremely happy with that. And, Peter and I have gotten along. I hardly knew Peter before that. I would say that's true. So uh, Peter and I have uh, gotten to be a little bit closer because of that, and that's just a gift also there. So, so thanks to you. So we're going to have to wrap up, but we, we want to say thank you to all of you in the audience because you are part of the healing here. And thank you to both of you up here on the stage. Michael and Dr. Trusheim for sharing your stories because we all learn and I think feel more connected and more human in hearing them. And I really want to encourage anyone who feels motivated to do so to write a comment card for Michael or for Dr. Trusheim. They're on your table. Out in the hallway, there's some baskets. But our experience with these kind of events is that it's really, really wonderful for the people who've stood up here and shared their stories to have something to bring home with them and to hear from you um, anything you want to share. And you can do it anonymously or not. That's completely up to you. So I would encourage that. 
Yes, thank you all so much for coming. Um, for those, for the many of you who are sticking around for the workshop that Annie and I are going to run this afternoon, we'll reconvene in here at one o'clock. And if anyone um, after this morning wants to come join us this afternoon to hear a little more about the research behind this model and about sort of the practical how to how to run this kind of model, um, it, we have an opportunity for you to to register now to come join us. Thank you so much. Thank you.